Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We seem to have the technical bugs worked out, and I'm Wes Livy, the moderator for this session this afternoon. This is session 1A, Accessibility in Historic Buildings and Landscapes. We have two presenters this afternoon, and we've agreed that um, they will both make their presentations of about half an hour in length, and then they'll jointly answer questions in the last half hour. So that will be the plan. And so I'm going to introduce them first so that both of them, so it's seamless uh, as they uh, go through the presentation. So first uh, presenter will be Wayne Morgan, is a registered professional planner and has his own heritage planning practice. For 20 years he was in New, was Newmarket Heritage Community, Community Chair and has worked in Toronto as a community planner then Senior Coordinator in the Heritage Preservation Services Unit. Wayne restored an 1861 residence and currently lives in an 1837 log cabin. Jill Taylor, co-founder of Taylor Hazel Architects in 1992. She is a specialist in the area of heritage master planning, policy development, built heritage assessment and evaluation, sustainable building design, materials conservation, facility planning, and the adaptive reuse of heritage sites. Known for her long-term commitment to policy and education, Jill has been awarded a fellowship in the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada for her work in heritage conservation and is currently president of the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. So ladies and gentlemen, Wayne and Jill. Thank you. Um, I've titled my talk, um, Accessibility and Heritage Properties, uh, a personal and a municipal heritage committee perspective. So I'm looking at this from both of these perspectives. And you're going to ask, why am I talking to you about heritage properties? Uh, the first thing is, uh, Community Heritage Ontario learned that uh, the province was looking into establishing standards, accessibility standards for the built heritage environment. And they were getting uh, input from a number of stakeholders. And we found out that uh, there was no heritage representative on this proposed committee. So CHO said that uh, uh, they wanted to participate and uh, I volunteered. I guess most of the members sort of stepped back and I was left out in front. So. Anyhow, um, I also worked as the uh, City Heritage staff dealing with alterations to, to properties in the City of Toronto. And in a number of instances they involved uh, accessibility requirements. So I'll be taking a look at some of those. And lastly, I think I have some empathy for both the heritage side of things and the accessibility side, as you'll see a little bit later on. At the outset, I'd like to suggest that we need to adjust our attitude as heritage advocates, our attitude about accessibility. We are making heritage accessible to ourselves. Not because others want us to, or because there's government regulation requiring it. Now this may sound strange to you, I don't think you think too much about accessibility. But you should, because Hey, you're not getting any younger. And with older age is increasing risk of disability. And uh, as my father said, old age doesn't come by itself. So uh, as I am slowly finding out, yes, there are challenges to, to getting older. And some of those challenges can lead to, to disabilities. We will all get there eventually. So think of it, you're doing this for yourself, for your friends, or your family, to make these 
heritage resources that you value so much accessible. But if you think that's not going to occur soon enough, and uh, hey, that's, that's decades off, you could also get in an accident in the meantime and, and be rendered disabled, such as this poor guy, myself. I was in a head-on collision. And this is me after two and a half months in the hospital. I'm still in the hospital. But I was rendered temporarily disabled and had to uh, avail myself of a number of means of transportation just to get around, let alone survive in my own house where the staircase could be another impediment to, uh, to, to moving forward. I'd also like to suggest terminology. Please do not use the term handicapped. Handicapped has, to somebody who is disabled, has a de, uh, denotes you're begging. You've got your cap in your hand, you're standing at the corner, you can't do anything else but beg for money. So don't use the word handicapped, use the word disabled. And it's important, and it means something important to uh, persons with disabilities. And disabilities are many and varied. The ones that we encounter most often are mobility. Uh, we, as heritage advocates, uh, encounter our mobility. Mobility issues, not, not just people in wheelchairs, but people who, uh, because of age, have become slower, cannot cannot walk the distance and they have to sit down. Um, sight is another, uh, another issue that uh, is a, a disability and believe it or not you have to take this into consideration in dealing with disabilities in heritage buildings. Hearing is also an issue. Uh, just think of when a smoke alarm goes off and you're deaf. How does that smoke alarm help you? There are other disabilities too, uh, and I'll give you an example, and here I get to bring in the War of 1812 into this, so I'm, I'm current with the federal government initiatives, but this is Brock's Monument in Queenston. My wife, who uh, is, is quite physically able to go up this, and if you haven't been to Brock's Monument, it's actually uh, uh, the column inside has uh, a circular stone staircase going up to the top of the, mount, uh, the monument and there are, I think, four holes uh, just below Sir Isaac Brock where you can look out over the landscape. She cannot access that monument. She has claustrophobia. She also has premonitions that she's going to fall down those stairs and when you get up to top, you go down, it's a long way down that circular staircase to the bottom. So accessibility can be wheelchairs, but it can be also a lot of other things that you have to take into consideration. You should also understand that technology has changed how we deal with accessibility. Uh, for example, wheelchairs have gotten larger. So standards that were developed some time ago for the, the size of the ramp, the turning radius, uh, have become outdated simply because wheelchairs are now becoming uh, self-propelled, so they're becoming much larger. Uh, the use of electronic door openers, uh, not something envisaged when uh, our heritage buildings were built. They're new technology that uh, is, has to be considered. And now voice activated devices are frequently being used. In the future, technology could change all that again. So the standards that we're looking at today may not be the standards of tomorrow simply because technology has changed things. Uh, not only the devices that are, re that are used to assist people with disabilities, but also how disabilities themselves are dealt with by individuals. So I was involved with the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. 
and it requires that the province make the province accessible to persons with disabilities by the year 2025. It doesn't say how it is to achieve that, but that target is specifically in the Act. It also sets out that a minister may establish a standards advisory committee to deal with accessibility. And the minister has established a number of accessibility committees to assist, well at the time I was there, her, Madam Mayor, uh, in establishing the standards uh, for, for accessibility. Uh, dealing with things like uh, service, uh, service delivery, um, and the, the built environment. So she did establish a committee for the built environment and it was to look at buildings and the outside environment associated with those buildings. And it also included recreation areas, structures and trails. So it was a pretty broad environment, but think of it as being buildings and, and landscapes. Um, it was interesting, she also established one for transportation. So we had the TTC sitting on our committee for buildings and the TTC also sat on the committee for transportation. And this advisory committee that she set up, and there I am in the red circle, Heritage was one voice among many. And you can see some of the, uh, the wheelchairs there, just look at the size of those wheelchairs that uh, we now have to deal with. It met for three years. We looked at standards in other provinces and countries. We looked at existing standards in Ontario, both provincial and municipal. So there are standards in the building code dealing with accessibility and some municipalities such as the City of London had their own set of standards for dealing with accessibility in their municipalities. So we looked at those. And we came up with a recommendation in May of 2010 uh, to the minister and it was a prescriptive not a performance based standard a prescriptive meaning it gives specific criteria for the ramp the slope of the ramp the width of the ramp and everything else washrooms it gave dimensions to those so that was a prescriptive a performance based is essentially saying here's a goal you achieve it you know, tell me how you're going to achieve it. And that's happening frequently in, with uh, elements of the building code where they're putting performance requirements in there saying, you know, make it safe for fire, show me how you're going to do that. But this committee wanted detailed prescriptive standards. So their, their recommending, recommendation to the minister was really quite lengthy and, and did get into very specific details. And we had great arguments about what it was to cover uh, and uh, it was decided that it, we would just restrict it to new construction and change in use renovations. So this is where heritage comes in. You're not in new construction, but yeah, your change of use somewhere in there, heritage is involved. And I, as the Heritage representative, got the committee to support a recommendation to the minister that Heritage may be exempted from the standard, but alternative solutions must be provided. And the exact wording was, new construction, change of use, or extensive renovations shall comply with the requirements of the standard except where it affects the natural, cultural, or heritage value of its protected facility or environment where an exemption from uh, compliance occurs in, well, in this case in C, an alternative solution shall be determined. So it's important that the word protected was in there. So that was a recommendation to the minister. Of course, the minister doesn't always have to list, listen to uh, advisors. Uh, oh, by, I should add, by the way, our definition of heritage was quite comprehensive. It include uh, 
listed properties, uh, designated properties, properties in a heritage conservation district, properties designated by the minister, and properties designated of national heritage significance. So it's a pretty comprehensive list of, of what would be dealt with uh, in terms of accessibility and what might be exempted. Although always keep in mind, although you've got an exemption, you have to come up with an alternative solution. However, the minister did not accept our recommendation and did not adopt did not adopt uh, the heritage recommendation, the heritage exemption. So it, it's not there. So what we are left with is the existing requirements. And there are some existing requirements. The building code in section 11 deals with the renovation of buildings. And it allows compliance alternatives. It allows the chief building official to, to permit what are called compliance alternatives. So you're, you're going to put an alternative scheme in there. It complies with what's, what you're trying to achieve, uh, protect it from, from being burnt down, protect it from falling down. Uh, so they're going to allow alternatives, but the chief building official has to rule on those. So in that section 11, there, there are exemptions for heritage buildings. And also, if you ever get to this step or are, are forced to the step, the Human Rights Code for Ontario has an exemption in there for, for heritage properties. And in fact, it's, it's the exemption that we tried to build on in, in building uh, the, the standard to the, the minister. Uh, it allows exemptions for heritage buildings, or I think they call them buildings, not properties but you have to provide an alternative solution. So, they didn't accept our, our recommendation for heritage, uh, but the building code is being amended. And uh, through an, a regulation that was passed on December 27th, 2013, and you can see the regulation number there, and it's become effective January the 1st of 2015, uh, there are new standards in the building code for alarms, smoke detectors, elevators and other devices between floors, barrier-free path of travel, and barrier-free path of travel means not only the ramp, but it means the doors that you get through, uh, so it includes things such as the width of the doorway. Um, it's updating washroom requirements. I don't know how many days I spent listening to how high you should erect a urinal, if there should be a urinal, how high there should be a sink in a, in a disability bathroom. Anyhow, there are new standards in there for, for washrooms. Uh, and there's to be accessible seating uh, in public assembly places, such as churches. This will affect churches. And uh, it also deals uh, with extensive renovations. So they're defining a renovation, oddly enough, by the number of employees. And, uh, or sorry, by the square, square meters of the suite. It used to be anything above 300 square meters, you have to comply. And uh, now the code is being varied. It can be less than 300 square meters. So that's the building code comes into effect uh, next year, January 1st. Outside of the building, uh, the minister dealt with this through an integrated accessibility standard. And this was a regulation passed not under the Building Code Act, but under the AODA. And uh, you can see the regulation number there. And it deals with outdoor paths of travel, such as sidewalks, ramps, stairs, uh, accessibility parking, uh, both on street and off street. So this could be on uh, heritage property you're dealing with. Recreational trails, 
And it also sets out timelines. Now, this is unlike the building code, which comes into effect January the 1st. These are being staged in terms of when they come into effect. Uh, the Ontario government has to do it by the start of 2015. Uh, the other public sector has to do it by 2016, and the public or the private sector, depending on this is where the number of employees comes in, uh, uh, 2017 or 2018. So those those are the standards that are now coming into effect. You've got some idea of the building code uh, and this. Uh, uh, new integrated accessibility standard. I'd like to talk briefly about some of the examples that I've dealt with and that you may confront uh, with your heritage buildings. And this is, no, it's not the ro home where Rob Ford lives. This is uh, Toronto's old city hall. And uh, like many heritage buildings, there was a very prominent staircase to the front of those heritage buildings. Uh, and you can see the number of stairs. Can you imagine the ramp that would have to be put in there uh, to, to make it uh, wheelchair accessible? Uh, so that's the issue. These front stairs, monumental front stairs, what do we do? In this case, an alternative solution was found. And this is a side, uh, side entrance to the building. So if you're looking at your heritage buildings, it's desirable that people with disabilities come in the front door like, like everybody else, but if that requires substantial alteration to the heritage attributes of the building, look and see if there are alternative entrances. Uh, and in this case, City Hall, most people today now use the side entrance into Old City Hall, which is, they've raised the sidewalk up a little bit so that it's at grade, it's wheelchair accessible. Another one I dealt with was the Don Jail. Again, the same sort of situation, monumental stairs in front. Um, an alternative entrance was found for this. This is now part of uh, uh, a hospital, and the uh, new hospital entrance uh, accommodates uh, accessibility for this disabled. Well, this entrance is still functional, still can be used. Uh, but it's not the, the primary entrance into the building. This is one I wasn't involved with, but I see with quite frequently, and it's in Gravenhurst, and it's the Bethune House. Here the question is uh, the veranda and achieving accessibility for the veranda, and you can see there's no, no ramp uh, up to the building. What they've used, as you see in the photograph on the right hand side, uh, they use lift. This is an alternative solution. It's not one that is desired by the disabled community, but in this case it can work because this is a museum. Uh, there are interpreters for the museum. They have to let you in the front door, so there can be someone come out from the front door uh, to operate this lift. So anybody who was going into the building has to get an interpreter to let them in. So this, this alternative works for this building. This is the Arts and Letters Club on Elm Street in Toronto, another one which I did deal with. And I don't know if you can make out the ramp there in the bottom, but the ramp is in the public sidewalk area. So this is an issue that uh, we had in Toronto, and you probably have in, in many of your communities, where the buildings front right on the street. There's, there's a zero lot line there. Uh, there's no front yard that you can put this ramp in. In this case, we, we put a ramp beside the building uh, and decided that since this was a side street with not a lot of traffic, that this is something that could work for this building. There was no alternative entrance to the building. We looked at the back, and of course you can see down the side there really is, is no alternative to get into the building. This is uh, Tip Top Taylor's. Uh, it was converted to the uh, Tip Top Lofts. Uh, and 
a beautiful building, very symmetrical, and the architect who was doing the renovations here uh, said, well, you know, it's a balanced facade, you know, you divide it down the middle, it's the same on one and the other side, so it should have a ramp on either side. And I said, no, 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 we're trying to minimize the impact here. One ramp is sufficient. So this is something that you may encounter uh, with some of your heritage buildings. Uh, in this case, it, it worked because coming up the, the stairs to the building, there was a sufficiently wide platform for, for turning to occur uh, for, for wheelchairs and for the doors to open to let them get in. This is the distillery district, also in Toronto. And this was a case where the, the grade in some of the entrances there wasn't a good relationship there. There was, there was quite a separation. The street you're actually looking at is uh, Tank House Lane, and uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't brick. Those bricks were added uh, re relatively recently. Um, but the grade was raised so that the doors that you see, the circular arched, arched windows above, um, the one, one door, there are actually two doors there. The grade was brought up to those doors. That still didn't help with the front of the building where there was a separate retail unit in the front of the building. And in this case, I agreed that uh, a new entrance could be put in. So you can see uh, closest to the right-hand side, uh, that flat arch. Uh, actually got an I-beam over it, uh, entrance was put in. You can, act, you can still, someone walking there today could still say, I see that as being a, an alteration because the bricks haven't been painted to match and the door doesn't match the, the other, other doors and windows that appear on that elevation. So this wasn't the principal elevation of the building. We did allow this alteration to occur. It's distinguishable. Uh, yet sympathetic, it has an industrial character to the, to the entrance, and yet you realize it's not part of the original entrances. Uh, this is the type of building that you might find in many of your Main Street communities. This is the uh, Scarborough Archives. Uh, this one is unusual in that it exists on its own, so it's not part of a Main Street area. Maybe it had intended to be, but it's not. Uh, and the archives are in there now, and the issue there is, is the veranda. Since it was being used as an archives, and is still used as an archives, we agreed that the, uh, the alternative solution of putting a, a, a ramp in at the back and making the rear door accessible uh, was a good alternative solution in this case. In fact, the front doors really never open to this, uh, to this building. Now, if this was a retail facility, uh, you could see that there would have to be a different solution to a ramp in, in the back because the dark front doors would have to open for, to service people. So those are some of the exteriors and some of the solutions that, uh, that I dealt with. However, and they were just on the exterior because many of our heritage buildings don't have the interiors designated. However, there are many interior issues that if you do have uh, a heritage uh, interior, you're going to have to deal with, and that's washrooms. Access to upper and lower floors or different levels on the same floor. Um, a case was brought to me when I was at the city for, for Newman House, which is part of the University of Toronto campus, and they uh, wanted access from the ground floor to the second floor, and there's a beautiful staircase in the inside, and I said, thankfully, there's an Ontario Trust easement on the property. Go see the trust and negotiate with them how you do that, but you can put elevators on the interior of buildings to deal with interior issues. You're going to have to deal with a barrier-free path of access within the building. 
and some of the things you have to look at are floor service surfaces. Uh, perhaps you should use the subway in Toronto and you'll notice that uh, as you get close to the edge of the, the uh, station where the trains come in, there is a, a tactile uh, little bubbles along, along there in a different color and a different surface treatment. That's to assist people with uh, sight disabilities to know that uh, they're reaching the edge of the platform and not to go any further if there's not a train there. That, that issue is coming to the forefront in terms of uh, path of travel within a building, and it's usually institutional buildings that we're dealing with here. And as I mentioned, if it's a place of assembly, such as th this, this place, or a church, you're going to have to deal with accessible seating. And accessible seating is not just for uh, people with, with wheelchairs, but you have to understand that some people have uh, uh, assist animals with them. Or maybe they have an assist caretaker with them, another person to help them. So those sorts of arrangements have to be worked out uh, for interiors of spaces. I should, should mention before leaving uh, and discussing the implications for an MHC, the importance of dignity to a person with disability. Uh, you just saw, I talked a bit about the term handicap. That's one way that denotes uh, a lack of dignity for persons with disabilities. But persons with disabilities are looking to, to achieve the same level of access that you get to a property. Whether we can fully achieve that or not is another question, but they want to do that and they want to do it in the same way that you do. And you've got to recognize that if you're putting them around to the back entrance, you're, you're dealing with their, their dignity and you are, are compromising their dignity. So if it's accepted, that is accepted as an alternative solution. They are making a compromise on their part. Okay, so what are the implications? I'm on a Municipal Heritage Committee. What does this mean to me? I think the first thing it means to me, to you, is get the properties designated. That is your important entrance to deal with disability. Uh, I can say categorically, if it's not designated, you really don't have a say in, in dealing with accessibility and, uh, and what that can do to heritage building. And designate under part four, part five. Part five, the districts will have their own challenges because you're gonna have to include accessibility guidelines with your own district designation. The issue of listed properties, I put a, a question mark beside it, whether or not they're covered. And I can't say categorically here that they are, are covered and that you can have a say if uh, uh, they have to be modified to deal with uh, accessibility. This is a legal question, and, and I don't know if there are any lawyers here, but it's one you can take back to your own uh, legal staff. Can a listed property contain a heritage building as defined by the building code and when compliance alternatives, so that's section 11 of the building code, would they apply to it? Can the chief building official allow compliance alternatives to listed buildings? I can't say definitively, but there is a definition in the building code of what a heritage building is. And if you can't read it, it says a heritage building means a building that is designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. Okay, that's quite clear. Or B, that is certified to be of significant architectural or historical value by a recognized non-public organization whose primary objective is the preservation of structures of architectural or historical significance and the certification has been accepted by the chief building official. So, you know, maybe that covers listed buildings. I, I can't say for sure. Go back to your, your legal experts and ask them. Uh, but, but for certainty, if you want cer certainty, move those properties over to designation. Get your municipality to designate them. And when you do designate them, 
clearly define the building's heritage attributes. Uh, list those heritage attributes in the designation bylaw. Even for your listed properties, you should be looking at, at a list of heritage attributes. I know that's uh, not required under the Ontario Heritage Act, but it helps when you come to discussion dealing with accessibility and what's being altered. Develop lines of communication with your chief building official. I know that can be challenging, but they, they are interested. And in fact, at the City of Toronto, we had good, good lines of communication. Uh, open lines of communication with your municipal advisory committee, accessibility advisory committee. Encourage solutions that are, you know, and these, these are standard, reversible, minimize adverse impacts, make use of new technology, and are distinguishable. If you've got no solution or you can't come to a solution, prepare a good explanation of why you cannot uh, make the building accessible. But be very careful to pick your battles. Uh, remember, as, as heritage advocates, you're up against somebody with, with disability. Uh, public can look more sympathetically on somebody with a disability than they can on a heritage building. And keep in mind that standards could change in the, in the next five years. Uh, the they've province is committed to re-examine these standards and go back and look at them again. And I'll leave you with this. Can this structure that I showed you at the very beginning, even, even though, assume it's a municipal structure now and it's not a nationally owned monument, which is not, not controlled by the AODA, can this structure be made accessible? And if it can, how can you do it? And we'll leave that to questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. My name is uh, Jill Taylor, and um, I'm an architect at Taylor Hazel Architects Limited. Uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Okay. Thank you. So our cultural heritage places have changed over the years, and an interpretation of cultural heritage places has changed. Our approach to people with disabilities has also changed, and this image was really um, sort of captured all those things in one, uh, in one slide for me. We, we come to places differently, uh, we educate ourselves differently, and, um, and we definitely uh, are different people. Access to our environment is not only access to the built environment, and I think that's important to recognize because there are all kinds of linked accessibility issues that we hear about. The word access is used as access to justice, access to education, access to employment, and all of these ideas about access to services are linked to human rights and freedoms for everyone, as uh, Wayne has indicated in, uh, in his very good presentation. No matter what their challenges, physical, social, cultural, or economic, the goal for the province and for municipalities is to try to eliminate barriers. And um, how does that really affect us as we try to preserve our historic environment? What we're trying to do every time we address this issue is to balance maximum access with minimum impact. As I mentioned, historically cultural landscapes and buildings were not designed to be readily accept, um, accessible to people and, and Wayne slides indicated that with the stairs to various public buildings. We are charged with adapting and preserving at the same time and that's a big challenge. We have to embrace the possibility of providing access to, the, to historic places for all people. And as humans, we face challenges, aging being one of them, and our historic sites face challenges. And we share that idea of challenge, and the balance idea is very important, again, to remember maximum access and minimum impact. I'm going to show you a few slides about our firm and who we are at Taylor Hazel Architects. And uh, I know that there are a number of people, including contractors, who will see their work displayed prominently in, in my presentation here. 
um, who, uh, who we've worked with in, uh, in our practice. We're a firm of, uh, of about 20 people. We have historians, architects, planners, and uh, technologists uh, working with us. And um, a, a very big part of our practice is in heritage conservation and the adaptive reuse of, uh, of buildings and sites and, uh, and a commitment to sustainability. We're, we're very broad based and primarily um, deal with existing buildings even in our new work. Much has to do with planning and master planning for large historic sites and cultural heritage landscapes which are more and more of great concern to us as they are for the community who wants to ensure access to, to sites. We're involved in orthodox conservation of structures and monuments, uh, but primarily for the municipal, provincial, and federal sectors and their agencies, rather than for private uh, company, if, uh, for private owners. And our practice is firmly rooted in the fact that historic buildings, as made clear in the excellent um, keynote address this morning. Um, are key to the preservation of towns and cities and in the creation of civic places that have longevity and really are going to ensure a sustainable uh, townscape and cityscape for us. Uh, we replan existing and abandoned sites such as the uh, Guelph um, uh, prison and the, um, the Brockville psychiatric hospitals. Uh, and we work for large organizations doing protocols including accessibility uh, in, uh, in concert with heritage for uh, organizations such as Metrolinx. And um, some of the projects that we do are quite large and last over decades, uh, which, is, which is a really interesting aspect of our work because we get to see how legislation changes from the beginning to the end of a job. We're also architects for new work where accessibility has to be uh, implemented under the building code for uh, part three buildings, that's public buildings. And also with conservation plans, heritage district plans, um, uh, where as Wayne mentioned, there are new challenges in the production of guidelines that preserve buildings as well as call for their adaptation. We're registered in Nova Scotia and PEI as well as in Ontario. And uh, we continue to work on large projects that, um, that require um, a lot of uh, 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 rigor in terms of preservation as well as um, the accommodation of the Ontario Building Code and the AODA. We also respect and are very appreciative of our colleagues in the heritage conservation trades and um, our work brings us um, thankfully into many situations that we would never see if we were on the ground or, um, or just a member of the, the public. And our work is very much based on philosophy and ethical practice in conservation and that's very essential to us and if we weren't able to maintain our uh, commitment to to ethics and, and ongoing uh, commitment to standards we probably wouldn't practice any longer. So uh, what does access mean in historic places today? Um, it means being accessible to all persons who may have challenges in terms of their mobility, their cognition, their sight, or their hearing, and it applies to all the built environment, cultural heritage landscapes, uh, archaeological sites, buildings, and townscapes and neighborhoods. Once we thought only of people in wheelchairs as being required to be provided for, but now we are attuned to a more universal concept of access. We no longer look at the disability, as Wayne said, we look at the person, and uh, we don't see one or even multiple challenges as being um, insurmountable in architecture. It applies to the elderly, the middle-aged, and the very young. It applies to caregivers um, uh, with wheelchairs, scooters, strollers, and stretchers. It applies to people, as Wayne noted, with temporary disabilities, and to all genders, races, and cultures, and it's based on human rights. It's really rooted, again, in ethical and social responsibility that we all share, and 
provision of lack of access to public buildings is apparently one of the number one complaints to the Human Rights Commission. So that's, it's very important for that reason. Access is a concept, but it's also regulatory, as, um, as Wayne indicated. And in order to uniformly be implemented, there are, there are, there's legislation at the provincial and municipal level that, that um, creates rules and um, rules that must be abided by. And we heard about the AODA, the Ontario Building Code Act, the Ontario Heritage Act is a part of this because of um, designation registering buildings and part five. Uh, the Planning Act uh, combines access as well as um, heritage, PPS, uh, heritage easements on provincially and uh, publicly owned property and environmentally, as uh, environmental assessments also deal with issues um, with uh, accessibility and heritage together. Municipal regulation of heritage and access has um, appears in very many documents that uh, that are regulations, and Wayne has mentioned a few of these. I just um, want to indicate that there are bylaws that do re uh, relate to accessibility that really uh, are very much a part of what we have to look at. The province. If, if, a, if the province owns buildings, and many of them are very uh, important heritage buildings in the public sector, and they have not only the guidelines and, um, and acts that they must conform to, but they have their own requirements, which are very often more stringent than the requirements of the municipality. Um, so uh, the province regulates its own um, heritage uh, conformance and... and um, and provision of the balance between access and, and uh, heritage preservation as well. I want to focus for a few minutes on the um, standards and guidelines for the conservation of, uh, pre of, um, of historic places in Canada because very often when you are trying to, to implement uh, um, barrier-free accessibility in a heritage property, you have to do a heritage impact assessment, and very often people ask you what your approach is as it relates to the uh, standards and guidelines. So the standards and guidelines, for those who aren't familiar with it, is um, it's online and it's available to everyone and you should uh, really consult it, and it's the result of many, many years of federal and provincial consultation. It doesn't replace the obligations um, to conservation that are uh, provincially or municipally legislated uh, or the Ontario Building Code, but it has a very good set of parameters to deal, to help us make decisions. And the most important thing, I think, in, in implementing um, barrier-free access in uh, historic properties is really to follow the de decision-making tree that's spelled out in many documents um, but in particular in the standards and guidelines. And it has to do with a three-step process that has to do with understanding, planning, and intervening. And this three-step process is something that's recognized internationally and in North America and other, um, uh, and uh, particularly the United States, as being the way that you approach any intervention in a heritage building. Understanding means, as Wayne was saying, that unless you understand the heritage character of the site or the building, uh, or have a statement of, of its heritage value, you really can't start a project that has to do with heritage, um, with barrier-free access. And um, if there is no statement of heritage value, which really does isolate the characteristics that are most important about the exterior of the site, the exterior of the building or its interior, you can't make decisions. So even though there is no statement, I think that that's the first place to start. So why is barrier-free access important and, and not just legislated for heritage buildings? Uh, for one thing, it better guarantees the long-term and wise use of heritage resources. Um, it provides access to the public environment and our cultural environments, and it's a human right, and that is a human right. It gives us access to the dis distinct and valued environments that our culture has made, and it is part of the contract that we have in terms of social responsibility with, uh, with all people. 
What are we trying to preserve when we alter a historic place to provide barrier-free access? We're trying to preserve its heritage value. And the heritage value is linked to scientific, historic, scientific, cultural, social, or spiritual significance. And we're also trying to protect its character-defining materials and physical uh, character. Working through um, a project that involves heritage, um, a heritage building and barrier-free access, uh, we have a, a system that we go through, which is also recommended by the standards and guidelines, which has to do with identifying the value, as we talked about, then preparing the project requirements from an accessibility audit standpoint, preparing multiple options for, uh, for um, provision of access, consulting others, and preparing the heritage impact assessment. The standards and, and guidelines go through a number of, um, of uh, aspects that have to do with um, the preservation of a, of a site while you're, uh, you're implementing a change. They have to do, uh, they, they say that you have to use the gentlest means possible when preserving or intervening. We have to respect the heritage value of the site. We maintain character-defining aspects, and we make interventions in a way that are physically and visually, visually compatible with the character of the site. One of the steps that we um, that is very important to uh, to to preserve within the uh, the process is to consult others, and that's a very important. Uh, part of uh, assessing the heritage value as well as, um, as assessing what has to be done to the site to make the site accessible. Wayne's talked about a number of the Ontario Building Code, um, Part 10 and Part 11 provisions that govern um, wh what you have to do to a, uh, when you're dealing with a heritage building. Um, basically, Part 10 of the code um, says that if you're maintaining the unless you main, if you change occupancy you have to um, you have to go uh, and you increase occupancy you may have to alter the interior of your building for accessibility um, but that part 11 provides for existing buildings to maintain their current status uh, and that there are voluntary upgrades that are are, are possible under part 11 but that any addition that you make to a building, including a heritage building, must conform to the current Ontario Building Code. There are many standards and guidelines um, abroad that are really good to look at. Uh, they are all online, the Australian standards, the American standards, and uh, the um, Association of Preservation Technology briefs are really very helpful. I've got a, a little video to show. Oh, wondering if I can get the sound turned up somehow. These are the curators of uh, Spadina House and, um, and uh, Campbell House who are speaking about accessibility. Recent research uh, has been done actually at the University of Buffalo. Uh, a, a huge study around the size of different types of mobility devices. They categorized mobility devices in three different ways. First is manual wheelchairs, then there was powered wheelchairs, and then there was scooters. So if we go back to that five foot training space, 50% uh, of manual wheelchair users can turn in that five foot training space, which means 50% can. So as a many, most accessibility standards use that as a baseline. And even at that manual wheelchair level, um, it's not nearly sufficient for a couple of people. And as you go through the other types of mobility devices, it, it gets worse. Um, we have some really good, credible information now as to exactly how much space is required. And we can say that for, if you want to accommodate, say, 90% of power wheelchair users, you need this much space, or if you want to do accommodate 95% of manual wheelchair users, you can have this much space. So we have a lot of that information available now, and it really stretches anywhere from, uh, let's say, 16 
1,500 through to 2,400 in terms of that range of just how many uh, wheelchair uh, or scooters that you're targeting to meet with your design. Um, in the ideal world, we go with the biggest number, but that, that is a really, really huge challenge in new buildings, uh, never mind trying to sort of fit some of those things into older architecture and heritage properties. So it, it is a tricky process. Um, equipment is getting bigger, uh, people are getting bigger, um, and are, are requiring more physical space. And trying to balance that is uh, it's a challenge we, we have to deal with every day. So I want to wrap up the interview by asking you what you think are the most you know, the favorable things that are happening in, um, in your profession, where do you see the biggest strides being made, and, and uh, maybe whether it's attitudinal or from, a, from an accommodation standpoint, uh, focusing on the heritage of our I think the biggest news is the fact that accessibility is now a completely integral part of all heritage programs. Uh, and I've seen that across the board. Uh, before it was either forgotten or it was ignored or it was at the end we figured out when we were going to miss that that's something we have to deal with. So the, the good news is now in terms of project development, accessibility typically is an integral part of the program uh, right up front. Um, and uh, sort of is considered all the way through. If I think of some of the, the projects that uh, we've worked on, um, Muslim Call is probably the best example, uh, you know, one of the oldest and most revered historic properties in Ontario. Um, there were many challenges in, in terms of uh, you know, the heritage issues. Um, and uh, we are out of the solution, I think, was uh, very beneficial in terms of preserving the heritage. Uh, not having a huge impact uh, on that building, but making it completely accessible for all the to get in and out. Um, so solutions can be done, and solutions like that I think can see it more and more and more. Um, and then, you know, it's, I'm hard pressed to think of significant heritage projects where accessibility hasn't been considered at this point. Okay, well that's that's great. Thank you so much, Bob, and to your team here at Glacier uh, Avenue East in Mississauga, and um, we look forward to hearing more about you and working with you as we get more involved in heritage projects and um, and see good solutions and innovation coming out and lots of cooperation and consultation. Sorry about that um, that glitch. Um, the first video uh, was of um, the curators from Spadina House and, um, and Camel House talking about accessibility and it was a very good clip I can show you afterwards. Uh, this was Bob Topping who is a very fine accessibility cons uh, consultant in, in Toronto that we work with a lot. I'm going to um, quickly flip through a couple of slides um, that are exemplars of work that we have done in Barrier Free, but I won't dwell on any except for the one that Bob mentioned, which is Osgood Hall, which is at the very end. Um, this project, the National Club, is one that was done um, by our firm with J.D. Strawn, and it's a special project, and I want to mention this and highlight it, because it was the result of a bequest of a woman whose husband frequented the National Club, and, when she, and she was in a wheelchair, and um, when she passed away, she bequeathed half a million dollars to uh, the National Club for the provision of barrier-free access. And no one knew about this. It was a big surprise when the will was open. So it was, uh, that's, it's a very good news story. And uh, the way that provision was made here is that the former women's entrance, and this was, the, um, this was funny as well, I think in retrospect, I think she would have liked this. Um, was used to provide barrier-free access at the ground floor uh, right here. So that, um, that was used for the insertion of an elevator. Uh, we tested it many times. I mentioned that we do a lot of work with our clients to prove uh, and to test things that we're doing, providing multiple options. And we used the, um, the existing women's waiting room and provided um, the elevator in the stairwell space. And it worked out really beautifully. Uh, we've done other work, for instance, at the police headquarters. 
um, at the Humber College Lakeshore campus, which we restored. And I mentioned that there are increasingly, as we have to develop guidelines for the provision of um, access and, and construction and impact in um, heritage conservation districts, consider accessibility a very big uh, part of it in the landscape as well as sidewalks and buildings itself. So for Osgood Hall, I'm just going to show you some slides about what lengths we went to as a team um, involving the City of Toronto, Ontario Heritage Trust, uh, the provincial government, the judicial body, um, and the Crown Law Association to work out the heritage approach to the front door. And this went on for more than three years. I think it was four years. And it was through consultation and, and modeling and talking about things over and over and over again that this approach was first conceived and then um, worked out in detail. Osgoode Hall is a national historic site, so there are a, very, a great number of parties involved. So it wasn't just that we did the front entrance, we also provided barrier-free access through various parts of the site, which I won't talk about now. It's, um, this is Osgoode Hall, the, the uh, front entrance before. There were all kinds of sidewalk issues, there were barrier-free door operating issues, as well as the change of grade that we had to deal with. So what we decided to do was go back to basics and make models that, and model many, many scenarios for the, uh, for the, uh, for the overall and then the detail approach to, um, to the barrier-free access ramp which um, was in the end symmetrical. It went up from both sides because the line of traffic was coming from two directions, one from, the sub, uh, from two different subway stations. So we, um, we created models which we, um, we took around to various committees and worked with them and adjusted the models over time. And then we decided to build it full scale and to work out the details in full scale and to show people what the impact would be. And this was very, very effective. It was helpful for us as we worked out the details, but also for the public and for the EA process that had to go on uh, in terms of public participation and knowledge about the project because it was such a, an important historic site. So we, and this is always an option. You can always build out of cardboard. We're talking about ramps. We're talking about provisions of sidewalks and other, other things. Don't forget that you can go right to the, the full scale mock-up and figure out the details and talk to people about how things are, are going to be done. So that's, that's how we came up with the final result is by testing and, um, and by, uh, by mock-ups in the field. And there were a very great number of technical details and uh, aspects of reversibility and showing off the, um, the features underneath the ramp that had to be implemented and, were, uh, and are there today. Wayne said he went and saw it the other day, so it, it worked out very well. So I just want to close um, by saying that this is our Goodwill ambassador. He said I could use his photograph. He's at the, he was at the bridge on May 2-4 weekend uh, on the way to Southampton. And um, I want to stress that achieving low impact and maximum access comes from co collaboration and understanding diversity, from knowing that everyone is different that every place is different, that things are changing every day, and that respect and dignity are the core shared values that we have for our, for our public buildings as well as for the people that use them. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, first, I apologize that the remote was really remote and I didn't know where it was. The other one is if you have a question, perhaps if you know to which panelists you wish to address it, that would be helpful and we're open for questions. Please, sir, in the back. We talk, we've talked about uh, access for uh, 
disabled people. What about um, egress? How do they get out of a building that's on fire if they're on the tenth floor of a building visiting their lawyer and uh, the fire starts, the first thing that happens is that the elevator shut down and they've got ten floors to go down or whatever on, on either side or there's uh, it, normally there's you know you have two exits if, the, if there's a fire at the front door yeah. you go to the back door what happens to these people that something happens at the front door yeah. how do they get out well there are two things Don one is that the building code requires that you provide areas of refuge areas of refuge in the building so that if somebody gets up to the 14th floor and they, the elevator is sh uh, shut down that uh, there's an area of refuge where they would go and there are also fire marshals in the buildings. The public buildings have um, a coordinated fire team that know where the areas of refuge are and the fire, the fire people know where the areas of refuge are so that would be the first place that they would go. Um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that um, this on the ground or kind of um, uh, proactive program approach to managing barrier free access and um, emergencies is really important in a lot of the buildings that we do. So there, there are health and safety committees whose job it is to put on, literally put on a, a fireman's hat somebody is designated to do that and and find out where people are and get them out of the building in the safest way or just stay with them in, in the event of a fire Thank you. lady uh, in front of him please so, um, i was just wondering how you got away with not having railings for the oscar hall project. that's an excellent question and it was because we worked very closely with bob topping who's um a very Ever guy. And it has to do with um, municipal regulations which actually govern um, some of the exterior code in terms of a barrier free. Um, have to do with railings. If you have, you know, if you have a couple of inches, you don't need a railing. So uh, we used curbs and grade changes in order to achieve the non-railing situation. So um, we went up to two foot 11 and a half inches without a railing and then um, railings are required after that. So there are often, by knowing the building code and by knowing what the, uh, the nominal uh, requirements are, you can, and often we do this when we're designing barrier free access in heritage buildings, you look for opportunities just to um, integrate the, uh, the various aspects of the code so that you can not have a lot of, you know, this is always a problem with ramps, is that you have a lot of, you know, vertical pickets or something in front of a heritage building. So changing the grade is, is often a really, really good way to go. And in that case, the grade on the side that you didn't see was, was following the ramp, and we had curves that were to the required height. So it was all, uh, it was all compliant, but we avoided that. But it took a lot of trying to figure that out. And making, the other thing is, it was classified as a raised sidewalk because we started it so far from the building. If you have a very, if you can use a very, very low slope, you can, um, a very gentle slope and, and extend it to like one to 20, you know, or more, one to 30, then you're talking about a raised sidewalk. So there, there are other ways of doing it. At the back, next to the other gentleman, please. Uh, Further to railings, Jill, which also I wondered about uh, Osgood Hall. Um, I, I do quite a few uh, accessibility improvements for churches and stuff, and I have a few at the moment. But I, what do you do with a recalcitrant uh, chief building official? I had a church we were doing, he insisted, even though our front landing into the church was just under two feet above grade, and he agreed that we did not require railings yeah. on the stairs or the landing. But the ramp going off of there, he said, the building code says a wheelchair ramp must have a railing 42 inches high yeah. with pickets. Um, changing grade didn't matter. Well, I did find if, it, if it's over one in 20, or rather flatter than one in 20, it's not a ramp. So then he couldn't, he couldn't call it a ramp. Right. 
And, but he insisted that this ramp on the front of the church had to have pickets and had to have a 42 inch high railing and we could stop it at the front landing. Uh, so I refused to do it. We, we just found a different way to get in the church. But there, I mean, what are you gonna do? Go to the building code commission over a $5,000 project? Well, I think some people have. But it's very hard. Churches, it, you know, public buildings are one thing, and churches and, and other projects where there's a small budget involved are, are others. Um, the process of the Osgood Hall, it took four years to, with a committee structure that went along, and we went to council, and council opposed it, and the province said, well, we have jurisdiction. It was, in that case, it was, um, it's a building full of lawyers. And they were absolutely, absolutely adamant that they were going to be able to come through the front door. There were a fair number of disabled, blind, wheelchair-bound lawyers, and they were going to make they were going to make this happen, you know, before they died. And so it, it just kept in the hopper. But um, you know, we met with the city in this case with the city of Toronto. Um, we were we had national heritage status, so we had to go to the federal government. Um, uh, Romus was on the committee. Um, we had it was we just worked through it inch, literally inch by inch. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I see the time is uh, approaching that some of you may wish to go, and I think our panelists will stay behind to answer a few questions. I would like to say that uh, recently on the uh, internet I saw a set of stone steps like the front of City Hall about six steps high and you pushed a button and they all went right back flush and then a lift came up and moved you up over the next thing. If you have lots of money there are ways to keep the steps in place. The other interesting thing is that uh, Elections Ontario has asked has has asked that uh, all the sites that are used for this provincial election be assessed against the standard that Wayne described. And it's interesting that how many places where we can find where the front door is smaller than the door to the, the washroom and so you can't get your, wheel, your wheelchair in, but if you could, you could use the washroom. The, um, the other one, of course, is I'm very sensitive to now that any threshold that's over half an inch high because that's a bump for people on walkers and wheelchairs. It's interesting what you learn by studying that, uh, that act and, and the accessibility standard because we had to visit every site. It would take about half an hour in each one. So let's uh, thank our, our panelists and I have a gift for each of them, a, a compliments of uh, patrimony Cornwall heritage. Uh, well, okay. uh, yeah, it, I don't think, maybe somebody has another opinion, I don't think it can be made physically accessible, but it can be made accessible through interpretation and the use of, of technology. If you've got uh, cameras in the, in the top, you can give a view of what you can see out of Brock's Monument. Uh, on the ground, you can give, uh, you can help people understand the experience of going up the stairs from a video that would be in, in interpretation on the ground. So that's how I think I would make it. Thank you, everybody.